Uh, good, I think it's still morning. Good morning. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me to come and speak today. I'm just delighted to be here. And I can't tell you how thrilled I am to now be an honorary member of the cancer patient community. Um, I spent many years as a not very honorary member of the HIV community. And I hope that the little bit you may have followed about the work we did um, will give you some inspiration um, about what I believe we can do just as well, if not better, with cancer. Because uh, I think we kind of started out pretty far behind <clears throat> the eight ball. In fact, I was only supposed to live for two years, 21 years ago. And uh, here I am. So, uh, it, so my first and most important message to you is really never stop believing in change. I'm not suggesting people start believing in miracles, although if you want to, that's okay too. But what I believe in is change. And the key is to stay here until that change occurs. So that's my first and maybe the most important message I'm going to give you today. The other message I'm going to give you today, uh, and, and I hope it will stick with you, is, and I'm going to show you why, we live, unfortunately, in a healthcare environment where only the squeakiest of wheels get the grease, as one of my mother's sayings used to be. And uh, I wish it didn't work that way. I wish the system did what it said it was supposed to do and uh, offered up what it says it, it does. But in fact, the reality is it doesn't. And we have to fight for everything we get, no matter what anybody wants you to believe about the healthcare system. So I'm hoping that what I can do is convince you that in addition to doing everything you can individually with your healthcare providers, with your caregivers, with all the people that support you individually, that you will also support Lymphoma Canada and do some systemic treatment advocacy work as well. Because you can make change, I know you can, because I've lived to see it. And uh, unfortunately though, it may not make you as popular with some politicians and bureaucrats as you might like to be. So you'll just have to accept you may not be invited to as many birthday parties as you used to, but the, the birthday parties you do get invited to, you'll be glad to be at. So that's what I want to tell you. Um, so my, my presentation, I entitled it, um, for those of you who know the Rolling Stones, that proves how old I am, um, you know, they say you can't always get what you want, but you can usually get what you need. Unfortunately, in our system, you can't even usually get what you need. And I'm going to talk about why, and we're going to talk together about why. So let me see if I'm... I want to start, because I don't want to talk at you. I'm not going to talk at you for the next hour or so. We're going to talk with each other. So to start that conversation, let's do a little case study. So we've got a patient who's been diagnosed with lymphoma. And he or she sits across from the doctor and says, is there a treatment I can take? And we actually saw this happen just this morning, didn't we? The doctor was asked the question, when is this treatment going to be available for me? So it's the same question. The doctor replies, yes, but it's not available to you. And you're in shock, really, because if there's a treatment, why can't I have it? And the doctor, and you, so you say to the doctor, why not? So let's do a multiple choice, and you decide which of these things might be the reason that you aren't getting this drug yet. Let's start with one possibility. I'm going to ask you to raise your hands if you think this is a possibility as to why you're not getting access to this treatment. So could it be possible that the manufacturer has not applied to sell this drug in Canada? Is that possible? How many people would say it is possible? Excellent. And the rest of you think that they bring all the drugs 
to Canada. Every single drug that they make, you think they bring them to Canada. Is that with that? How many people believe that? That there is no drug that's sold in other countries that isn't available in Canada, be, being sold in Canada. Okay. So let's talk for a second about the reality of uh, the, the world of marketing. Anybody have I, any idea how much of the world market Canada is for the sale of drugs? Anybody think it's 20%? Anybody think it's less than 20%? Anybody think it's 10%? Anybody think it's less than 10%? Anybody think it's 2%? Right. Okay. So, if we're 2% of the world market, and the United States is 78% of the world market, where are you putting the action? Yep. So the reality is that most drugs, most drugs eventually do get sold in Canada, or at least are made available for sale in Canada. But we are so far down the list of countries they care about in terms of timing for that, that that very well may be one of the reasons that you have not, you're not receiving a drug that's available for sale in other countries. Because, and when you see the system that you have to go through in Canada, and I'm gonna show it to you in a minute, um, you are gonna say, well, it's no wonder they're not in any big rush for that 2% of the market. It's like way down the road. So don't rule that out. Now, another possibility, maybe, is that Health Canada has not, a, it, that someone has applied, but Health Canada has not approved that drug for sale. They've looked at the information and they say, we don't think this drug looks very safe from the clinical trial information, and or we don't think this drug looks very effective for people for this disease. Is that a possibility? Is that, can that happen? How many say yes? Absolutely. But let me tell you something about all of that. And this is very important to all of you in this room. It was very important to me when I was looking at drug trials. Health Canada makes that decision based on the clinical trial information that's given to them. Now, what's a clinical trial? A clinical trial is a group of patients who are chosen and, and vetted by the person who's doing the trial to try to prove the answer to a particular question. For instance, is this drug safe for people with a certain type of lymphoma? Okay? Uh, is this drug effective for those people? And they may ask some other questions as well. But remember, the answer you get to that question is only as good as the information you put in to answer it. So if you've only got 100 people in that trial, we only know the answer to that question for those 100 people. And, if those, and that's a very small trial, so it doesn't tell you very much. And if you look at who was in that trial and there were no women in the trial, we have no clue if that drug is safe and effective for women at all. If there were no Aboriginal people in that trial, who knows? If there were no people over 40 in that trial, who knows? So Health Canada, and Health Canada knows this, they know that for years and years, Canadians have believed that when they allow a drug to be sold in Canada, we all believe that that means it's going to be safe for every single person who takes it, and it's going to be effective for every person who takes it, because that's what the Food and Drug Act says. 
And that is not true. Okay? It is only true that if you replicate the people in the trial, and even then, you may get the same result out in the real world. But people out in the real world aren't like the people in the trial. And that's the other thing. When they choose trial participants, they choose people who are as healthy as they can be, given their disease. They try to choose people who don't have other diseases or aren't taking other medications so that they don't mess up their results. They get the best results they can. And very few of us in this world are that fortunate that we're just taking one medication, this one medication is going to be in this trial. And we often have many things going on with us that we're taking medications for. So one must be very careful when looking at a clinical trial result to know whether in fact it's true that for you in the real world, this drug is safe and effective. And it may not be for anybody. And that's when Health Canada does not approve it. The other thing Health Canada does is approve it conditionally. So Health Canada might very well say, we approve it for this population of people, or we approve it for this indication for people who've never taken any medications before in this class of drugs. But we don't think it would work as a second line, so we're not approving. We don't think it would be safe for people as a second line or we don't think it would be effective. So they can put conditions on it relative to the sale. So it's not cut and dried at that point either. But let's say that the manufacturer does apply and that Health Canada does feel comfortable enough with the clinical data to say, we're going to let you sell your drug in Canada. So then, but you're still not getting it. You're still sitting across from this doctor and this doctor's still saying, still not available. So then there's another thing called health technologies assessment. Isn't that great? I love that name because it doesn't have any people in it. Do you notice there are no people in that name? And the, it's a process that decides whether a drug has value. Okay, that doesn't just mean the cost of it though. Does it have value? to the provinces who pay for drugs, by the way, um, to be added to the list of drugs that the province is prepared to pay for. Now, how do they look at value? They certainly look at the clinical evidence, but they also look at the economics of the drug and the number of people who have it and the implications of all of that, and they decide your drug is valuable to the healthcare system, and therefore we will recommend to the province that they pay for this on its public reimbursement system. Right now, the organization that uh, has this responsibility is called CADF, the Coordinating Agency for Drugs and Technologies Ass Health Assessment. And its approval rate is, anybody think it's 75%? Anybody think it's less than 75%? Anybody think it's 50%? Anybody think it's less than 50%? Correct. It is approximately 48% of all the drugs that make it to health te technology assessment are found to be of value to the public system, okay? So that may be another reason you're not getting the drug because the recommendation has been made not, not to approve it. Now, drugs for cancers until April 1st, I think that's a very interesting day they chose, was being reviewed by another group of health technology assessment people called PCODER or the Pan-Canadian Oncology Drug Review. Its approval rate was in the 70%. Why? Because it actually had site-specific tumor oncologists looking at the clinical evidence. It actually equally weighted 
patient information about the drugs and why th these drugs are so important to them, as well as looking at the economics of it all. I have the good news is, well, there isn't any good news. There's no good news. The bad news is that PCODER has been taken over by Cadiff because the deputy ministers decided that was a better idea. And on Monday, Lymphoma Canada and CNETS Canada and a number of other organizations are going to be attending a, the first consultation about how this integration is going to take place. And Robin is going to be there fighting for you to try to save as much of this good system for cancer health technology reviews as we can. And it's going to be a big fight, and we're probably going to need your help for this fight, because it's not going to be won at this first meeting, I can tell you for sure. So you may be hearing a lot more from us on this, from Robin, asking you to sign things, asking you to come to meetings. Who knows what we're going to have to do? We don't know yet, but we are going to fight to try to save the health technology assessments for cancer. And when you're talking to politicians, and when you're talking to deputy ministers of health, you might want to ask them, what were you thinking? Why did you do this to us? And we will hold you accountable if, our, if, if we have even fewer cancer drugs approved and it's slower than it already is. We will remember who made this decision. So that's another hurdle. Let, but let's suppose you're in the 48% that actually makes it through there. So you've applied, Health Canada says it's okay, Health Technologies Assessment actually decides there's some value to your drug. One of the jokes that I often make with the provinces is, and I really do, but then I make all kinds of just terrible jokes, but I'm allowed to do that. Because I think once you've kind of been told you're about to die, you, you pretty much can do anything you want. And that's <laughs> pretty much the way I've, tr I've, I've lived the rest of my life. So I look at them and I say, okay, look, you've got a health budget. You're telling me if I get a disease where there's way lots of people with this disease, it's going to be really expensive if you approve my drug for reimbursement, right? Yep. Okay. And then there's rare diseases where the very few people have this disease. And because of that, they're really expensive to make and they're not going to make a lot of money on each one. So the cost of those drugs are really high and you don't want to cover those either, right? Right. So I said, could you tell me which disease I should get, please? Could you tell me which one is just enough people with just the right price that, you know, and I'll try to, you know, like, like Jeopardy or whatever, you know, Wheel of Fortune. I'll try to get that one. I can't promise, but I'll really try. And, you know, they look at me, of course, like, Louise, you know. But that's not so far from the truth. So you've got through health technologies, but so, the, so, then, so it's over to the provinces, and the provinces say, oh, health budget, health budget. So what they do then to slow the system down even longer for you to get the drug is they create, what they have created what they call the Pan-Canadian Pricing Alliance. And it's a group of all the provinces except Quebec that negotiate behind closed doors a price with the pharmaceutical companies. Now, I don't object to that. That's great. Let's get the best value for our money, absolutely. Here's the province prob problem with that. Here are the problems with that. Number one, there's no time limits for these negotiations. So they can take two or three years if they want to, and you're sitting there needing this drug, okay? Second thing is, They've put no mechanism in place for you to get that drug while they're doing that negotiation. So you're, I, I'm going to write an article shortly called, Is This Price Negotiation or Hostage Negotiations? And really, it feels to me a lot like hostage negotiations, because we're the hostages while they negotiate. 
And the third thing is, if you can believe it, provinces will sit at that table, they'll negotiate a price, which they all say is reasonable, and then some provinces still don't put it on their reimbursement formulary. So there's no commitment that they have to do that, even if they sit at the table and agree to the price. Like, what is that? You know, when did that kind of negotiation ever make any sense? Stay, don't, don't come to the table. If you're not going to, you know, don't fool anybody, which they do. So you may not be getting the drug because they're either still negotiating or negotiations have broken down, and sometimes that happens, and it's everybody walks away and nobody's getting the drug. So we, so, so we're still working on choosing the best answer. So you've had all those other answers which are possible. Another best answer can be that Ontario they, decides they can't afford it anyhow, as I've said. They've negotiated a price and they say, there's still too many people with this disease. I'm really sorry, even though it's good value and even though we got the best price we could from the pharmaceutical companies, there's still too many of you with this disease. It's going to break my budget. We're not putting it on. And that happens. Now, of course, if you have private insurance, your private insurance insurer does what your private insurer does. And we know that private insurers used to be quite liberal. Uh, and this is not a political, paid political announcement, I, a small l liberal, about what they paid for in their private plans. And they're tightening up like crazy. They're demanding that people be given generic drugs, even when the doctor has prescribed a brand name drug. They're doing all kinds of things to try to save money in their budget. So that could be another reason you're not getting it. If you're under a private plan, your private plan may have decided not to cover it. You may also not be getting it, and it's hard to believe, but I have friends who actually cannot pay the Trillium. You know about Trillium? You know that it's a, a, an Ontario government program for people who don't have insurance? Okay, but, but you ha it's a co-pay system. You pay the first so much, depending on your income. I actually know people who cannot afford their Trillium co-pay and who literally cannot get their drugs because they cannot afford their Trillium co-pay. I don't think that should happen either, but it could be another reason. And then, of course, all of the above is another answer as well. And the fact is it could be any or all of the above because that, all those four on this page and three on this page, all those seven things could be slowing up or stopping you getting a drug. Now, if that sounds like an efficient healthcare drug reimbursement system to you, you're a better person than I because it sounds like a camel to me. And the reason I say that is there's a very, very old joke that, um, uh, that a, a, a camel is a horse created by a committee. <laughs> so it started out, a be you know how beautiful and sleek horses are, nothing they don't need, right? Every bit of their machinery is just what they need. Well, and you, those of you who have ever been around can and they're actually not bad personalities either. Get near a camel, it's nothing like that. You've got bumps, they're uncomfortable, they, they're, they don't, the front and the back don't know what they're doing, and they don't even like it anyhow, and they mostly spit at you. I certainly had them spit at me. So that's, and that's actually what's happened in our healthcare system. Every one of those bits that you see there has been like grafted on as a new, as a new problem from the government's perspective in terms of managing their drug budget comes along. They just add a new bump to the camel. Okay, well, Health Canada approved it for sale. Okay, but, we're, but we don't want to pay for it, so we'll add health technologies assessment to slow, see if, if they'll argue there's no value to that drug no, nonetheless. And then if it gets through that, then, oh, oh, we still don't like it because we don't like the price. Okay, so then we'll have the Pan-Canadian Pricing Alliance, and that'll be another bump on the camel. 
And when we get to the bottom end, there's still the provincial budgets. And sorry, nice idea, price is okay, still can't afford it, gonna put my budget. And that's really the kind of healthcare system we have. And so, the bottom line though, the good news about all that, if you think there is any, is that you can influence every single one of those processes. And I want you, believe you for a moment, just believe me. Even if it feels like it can't be true, I know it can be true. So let's talk a little bit about how we can do that. First of all, even getting a manufacturer to bring a drug to Canada, you can influence. Let's suppose they're really, they've got it in a lot of other countries and they're really slow to bring it here. If you meet with that company and you make some commitments as an organization or as a community that you want this drug in Canada and that you will influence in every way you can the parts of the government processes that they need the hoops they need to jump through, that you're there and you're good advocates and you want that drug. And this isn't because you love the company or you have shares in the company or any other thing like that. It's because we as patients need that drug and believe we need that drug. Sometimes, and it has happened, that that's enough encouragement for a company to decide that they will in fact make an application because at least they know that they're gonna not be going it alone, that the patients want this and the patients will fight for it with them. So formally you have no role. If you, if you look on the Health Canada website, you're not gonna find a, a patients apply here to tell us what you think about anything. But informally, if you support, if you want a particular drug that's not being sold in this country, and Lymphoma Canada hears from you, I'm sure that they will be glad to hear your voice and do what they can to encourage that drug to come to this country. So let's talk then about the next uh, step in the process. There isn't so very much you can do about the safety and efficacy of uh, uh, intervening there, although you can intervene there too. Let's suppose Health Canada is worried about approving a drug for everybody because they feel the clinical trial data doesn't support there weren't enough people in the trial or there weren't enough types of people in the trial for everybody to get it. You can go to Health Canada, you can say, why don't you at least approve it for people over 40 or people, you know, under 30 or whatever there is proof in the trial. Even if you can get a conditional approval from Health Canada, you can, you can talk to them about that. They will make the decision, but you can at least, if you've got good information, you can do that. But let's go to our really one of our biggest problems, which is health technologies assessment. And as I said to you before, they're looking at clinical evidence, they're looking at economic impact, and lastly they're, looking at lastly, they're looking at patient evidence to decide if there's value. And if they think there's value to the public system, they'll say yes. And as I've said to you before, we had a better system that they're trying to erode. We've got to fight that. Because if we don't, I'm going to give you a very dire warning, and I'm not doing it to frighten you. I'm doing it because I believe this. And you know what? If in two or three years I'm proved wrong, it will be my pleasure to stand up here and you can all throw buns. But unfortunately, I'm not wrong that often about these kinds of things. So I'm afraid that if we don't stand up together and say, don't destroy our health technology assessment system for cancer drugs, we're going to have fewer cancer drugs being recommended for reimbursement. It, it will take them longer to do it, and patient influence, it, patients will have less influence in the process. So support Lymphoma Canada, and when we need you, please be there for us, because we're, 
we need you because we're being there for you. And that's, that's what advocates do. So Lymphoma Canada is permitted to put in health technology assessment submissions. We are, at least as patients, through our organizations, allowed to put submissions in about drugs. So please provide them whatever information they ask you for when they ask you for it. We really need it. It's very, very important. And of course, support them in monitoring what happens through this transition. So then we have the Pan-Canadian Pricing Alliance. Um, there, I've told you the problems with that. The problems being no time limits, we don't get anything till they decide, and even when they decide, some provinces, particularly the eastern provinces, don't necessarily put drugs. You have a role here too. Um, I've been working with a number of the cancer groups to develop a formal recommendation to the governments about a proper framework for these negotiations that will include time limits, that will include a process for patients to get the drugs while they're negotiating, that will, as part of the negotiations, be an agreement by the provinces up front that once those negotiations are done, those drugs will be available. So I'm sure that once I get that done, I know Robin will, will see it, She'll look at it for you, and we'll decide how we move forward to try to push our government to make this system a better system for our patients as well. So as I said to you, one of my first comments to you was that Canada's healthcare system works on the squeaky wheel process. And now you, I hope now you can see why. Because the systems themselves, don't, don't invite you in very easily. So the only way you get in the door is by shouting, knocking, pounding, putting your foot in the door, and insisting on being there. And, and so unfortunately, I wish I could tell you that weren't true, but it isn't. And so what is advocacy? Advocacy is just a tool. It's a tool we use for squeaking. It's our squeaking tool, okay? And it's Really, when you're an advocate, which I consider myself to be, my job is not to go out and get for you what I think you deserve. My job, and Robin's job, is to hear you and ask you, what do you want? And then go and get what you want, not what we think you want. That's a good advocate. We can give you very good advice about what we think is possible, what we think might be harder, but you could still, sure still try for. But at the end of the day, we're doing the work for you. So it's what you want. So I wanted to just take you quickly. And, and, oh, the other thing I want to say before I go through this is there people believe that advocacy is some kind of a mystical thing that you do. You know, it's mystical. It's actually just a formula. It's just a formula. And whether you're advocating, and you do this all the time, by the way, all of you advocate all the time. You just don't call it anything formal, but you do it. And, and you just, it's just a formula, whether you're doing it for yourself, for somebody else, for a group of people, for a whole community, or for a whole country. That there's, a, there's a set of rules to advocacy. These are the way I write them down. Other people may describe them differently. This is how I describe them. So you're getting into an advocacy campaign, whether it's to talk to your doctor about some treatment you want that maybe your doctor doesn't agree you need, or whatever it is, or whether it's this big one that we're going to be taking on with the tr this introduction of, uh, of P-coder into CADIS. So the very first and most important thing always is to find out really what the issue is that, you're, that you'll want. What's the problem? What's the issue that you've got here? And you really have to know your facts. Because if you don't do your research and you go into a meeting somewhere and you say something that's not correct, they, then anything else you say after that probably won't hold any water. 
So do your research, whether it's research going in to see your doctor, find out everything you can about a treatment if that's what it is, or a diagnostic test you want done, or whatever it is, or even a bigger campaign. Make sure you're well armed, okay? Then, once you are, you have to find out who's your constituency. It may just be you. May, you may be advocating for yourself, but you may be advocating for your mom. You may be advocating for a group of patients. Whoever it is, make sure you know who you're advocating for because they're going to tell you what they want. So you need to know because the last thing you want to go in is, and not me, I don't want to go into this meeting on Monday and say, patients want an integration steering committee. We want a seat at the table during this integration. And then everybody behind me says, what? <laughs> who, said you, who said we wanted that? So you make sure you get your ducks in a row before you go in there, because you want to make sure that when, when you say it, everybody behind you is nodding. That's right, that's what we want. You need to know who all the players are. So you need to know who are the decision makers. So in the case of this pea coder and Cabot business, the real ultimate decision makers we know are the deputy ministers because they decided to do this integration. Okay? And, when, and to me, that's where the buck stops. And they don't like that. They'd like us to look over there, look over there at Cadith if it isn't working out. And that's what they write me. They write me these letters about, oh, don't worry. If it isn't working out, tell Cadith. No, I will tell Cadith. But when Cadith doesn't respond to me, I'll be back to you because I don't forget who made this decision. So remember who the decision makers are and remind them that you're never going to forget. Think of your other allies. It may be other cancer groups, as it is in, in this particular case. It may be your doctors, uh, depending on the situation. It may be researchers. Who knows? Maybe other patients themselves. It may be caregivers. It may be a nurse's association. Who knows? Find out everybody you can get on your side and make sure that they're going to support you. You need to know who are the people that are going to disagree with you and give you a rough time. And you need to know why. You need to know the motives for each of these because you need to be able to answer when they say, well, the, you know, the, we're told by the drug plan manager that, you know, if you go to the deputy minister, you go to the, the drug plan manager says uh, this is going to cost too much. Really? Well, we've done the numbers. And guess how much it's going to cost you if you don't do that, but instead you force us to go back to hospitals every three weeks, which is the alternative, by the way, to you not doing this other thing, for instance. And you do your numbers and you say, what do, what do you prefer? And you, so you really need to know what you're working with. You need to know other people who can influence them. Get to know political staffers, get to know bureaucrats. They're not the same, by the way. Politicians and bureaucrats are not the same. They don't have the same motivations. They're completely different animals. Um, and so you really need to understand them, get to know them as much as you can. And then there would be some people or groups who are undecided. There may be some cancer groups say, oh, I don't really know. Talk to them. Find out what, what you might be able to do or explain to them that might make them be on your side. So this is all to get ready, okay, for the main event, all right? So this is all your work that you do to get ready for the main event. And really, actually, you do. You, you think this, you don't do this, but you really do. And then I always think about if, it's re if, if push comes to shove, which I hope it never does, because I don't actually like to solve problems in the media. Um, my experience of doing that is you'll win that battle and you'll lose so many wars because the, no one will ever want to talk to you again. Even if you win, you'll have embarrassed somebody publicly and they are just not ever going to, you're never going to be in any inner circle or invited to any conference or invited to any meeting or anything else. So you really, really want to save that for the, you know, last possible moment. But you should think about it. So then you develop your strategies. 
And I always start with what I call private strategies, so strategies of meetings. And I always start from what I call the bottom, which I don't mean in a derogatory way, but I always start with the first level of decision makers and work up. Don't go around anybody. If it's your doctor you need to talk to first, don't go to the head of the medical department that he's in before you talk to your doctor. Um, you know, to be, because really you can find yourself in, in a lot of trouble. And, and mostly what happens is the people higher up send you back. They say, well, didn't you talk to so-and-so yet? Well, no, and then you're done. And then you'll never get another meeting with that person higher up in the chain. So be very, even if you know you're gonna get a no, even if you know this is just window dressing, do it anyhow, because you don't want to get dropped down because, because you missed a step. And then you get busy implementing those strategies. Have your meetings. If you need to start developing a position paper about something, if you need to start doing public meetings with, your com with people in your community, whatever you need to do, that's your campaign. And you'd be really well ready for it and implement it. And then, of course, always do an evaluation after you've done your, say you've done all the political, bureaucratic and political meetings you can do. Make sure you evaluate where you are. Okay, what did we get? What promises did we get? What did, where doors were shut? Whatever it is. And then ask your community, if that's who it is, or your mother, or whoever it is you're advocating for, are you satisfied at this point? If they say yes, even if you aren't as the advocate, that's it. If they say, not yet, I still want that, I want to get into that trial, or I want to get that drug, or I want that diagnostic test, or whatever it is they want. If they say, no, I'm not happy yet, then basically go right back up to the beginning because it's the same formula all over again and you just keep doing it and keep doing it. So the important thing I think we should all try to remember is that this is a marathon, not a sprint. And oftentimes, you know, people write a letter and they get a thank you very much, we'll pass it along, and then that's the end of the story for them. And they, they think it's, you know, it's over. It's only just beginning. And if you give up then, then people will know that you're the kind of person who gives up. People know I don't give up. People, when they see me come in a room, when politicians see me, when bureaucrats see me, they say, ooh. <laughs> well, sometimes they say hello. And then they say, ooh. But they know I'm not going to go away. They know that I'm in it for the long haul. And that's what they need to know about all of us in the cancer community. We are in it for the long haul. And we are not going to take one or two no's for an answer. I have a friend who, who says to me, and I love this, she says, whenever anybody says no to me, I always say, I guess I just haven't explained. It must be my fault. I guess I just haven't explained this to you right. So I'm just going to keep explaining it in different ways until you understand it, because then I'm sure you're going to change your no to yes. And it's really the way to think about it in some ways. It must be my fault. I'm just not explaining this right. And really, you do have to see it that way. Um, and there are many lessons to be learned. I, I sincerely believe there are many lessons to be learned from the HIV community. I don't say that just because I came from that community, but because I saw what they did. I saw what we did. And, I, and when I look out at a lot of other patient communities, I think there's some things, you might, tips you can pick up from them. And from me, I hope. And, uh, and that's really why I decided to, uh, to work in this community, because I think we have a lot of similarities and a lot of the same problems, and I think that we can make some headway um, together. And, uh, and so that's really why I've decided to do that. So, so here are some things, just some things to suggest. Please support your organization because 
they need to see numbers. They really do. One patient, that's one patient. But when they see that it's a whole organization of patients, that's fabulous. They, that, that, that makes a difference. Whenever you get a chance to meet politicians and bureaucrats, take that chance and tell them and tell them and tell them over and over and over again what it is you need every single time you see them. Tell other people the problems that you're having. And I don't mean whining, but I mean saying, can you believe, did you know that this happens in our healthcare system? Did you, have you, and that, and, and that today it's me and tomorrow can be you? So that people don't just see it, well, that must be your problem. No, no, actually, next time you need a drug, you're going to have that problem. Happens to be me today. Get support from others for your advocacy wherever you can. Remember, politicians only care about one thing, getting elected. How do they get elected? By people voting. So every single vote matters to them. Bureaucrats are another matter. But politicians, that's what they care about. I do sincerely ask you to learn about your disease as much as you can. Learn, come out to every session you get, like this one that you get a chance to. Talk to the doctors, learn about treatments, and learn to become your own advocate. And that's a scary thing because it means sometimes that you're gonna wanna do something that maybe other people don't want you to do, or you're not gonna wanna do something that some people want you to do. That's scary, it is scary, you know? But if you really feel the, the, the truth of your convictions and if you've looked up your facts and it's really the right thing for you, it's you, at the end of the day, you're gonna have to live with the decisions. And as I say, don't give up, this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. If you're for you know, instant gratification, my recommendation is go down to the local gelato store and get yourself a nice chocolate gelato. You'll be instantly gratified and then get back to this work because that's how it's gonna go. And, uh, and I hope that we'll work together. I do believe that it's not just Lymphoma Canada, it's all of our groups together. The bigger the voice, the more we can work together, the more we can be saying the same messages together, the better our chances to make difference in this system. I know it's true because I lived it. I know it can be done um, and I know that you can do it and I know that all of you have the capability to do it. And everybody will have a different role, for sure. Not everybody does the same thing, but there's a role for everybody in this, in this process and the more you can be involved, really, the better the camel is going to work for you. And it really still is a camel. So I kind of wanted to, I think that's enough. <laughs> it's probably more than my mouth. Um, but I'm very happy to, to debate, answer questions, whatever you'd like to do with the rest of the time we have here together. Thank you so much, Louise. We really appreciate it. And I want us to just open it up to questions in the room. But prior to that, we do have a question from our group in Waterloo. And the question is such, if, if a drug has been approved by Health Canada, but not yet approved for funding in our province or by one's own benefit program, is there a way to go get the drug through compassionate programs? Um, well, the answer is perhaps. Um, the, uh, I, cer uh, I certainly, well, it's, a, it's, such, it's, it's a complicated, it's actually a complicated story. Um, when we started out with HIV clinical trials, we demanded of the pharmaceutical companies that they have a compassionate arm to every single one of their trials for new drugs. And what that meant was that they put aside at least a few spaces for people who may not fit the trial criteria, but who were really in dire need and were really dying if they didn't get a chance to at least try this drug. And I don't know how much of that's been done with clinical trials for cancer drugs. 
Um, but it's, it's a chance at least then for a few extra people to get that drug. Um, in addition, it definitely you should always speak to the companies. If the drug has not been approved yet, some companies, and companies are different, um, we think of, of them as some big amorphous map, they're not the same. So some companies have quite generous compassionate access programs, some not so generous. Uh, also speak to the governments about this problem and see if they can work some arrangement with the pharmaceutical industry for some bridging, as we call it, of the drug until whatever is holding up the approval gets done. So there are ways, there are definitely ways, but they are, you, you really have to work at it and it's an individual thing. It's, there's no rule um, or policy, it's yes, you have to go and do the fighting, but, but it can be done.